Romans chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. The Apostle Paul writes, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Now, the uh, topic of our passage today is the same as it has been over the several few lessons that we've had in Romans, and it's the same that it's, it's going to be the same over the next few lessons in Romans, and that is the main theme of chapters 3 and 4, which is justification by faith alone. Paul spent two and a half, the first two and a half chapters of Romans talking in detail about how, all, about how the fact that all people are sinners who have broken God's law, and since we have all broken God's law, we are therefore guilty before the judgment seat of God and condemned. But God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And we are justified, declared right before God, not by our works, which are not good enough to earn us our salvation. We're not justified by our own efforts, but by trusting in what Christ has done for us. It's about saying, I cannot save myself. Lord, you have to save me. If you don't save me, I, I will be lost. And trusting in him for your salvation. Um, towards the end of chapter 3, let me just remind you. In chapter 3, verse 28, Paul said, Therefore we conclude, so this is his conclusion, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So we're not justified by our works, by our deeds of the law. We are declared righteous before God. God renders his verdict on our life and says, not guilty. Not because he's looking at our works, because otherwise we would be guilty. But because of the righteousness of Christ, which is applied to us through faith. And so in chapter 4 now, what he's doing is he wants to give us an illustration, an example of how people are justified. And who does he bring as his example? Abraham. Now, he brings Abraham on purpose because Abraham was considered by many to be the holiest person who's ever lived. And so if Abraham could not be justified by his own goodness, then none of us will. And so he asked the question, well, how was Abraham justified? Was he justified by his works? How was Abraham justified? And the answer is no. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 3. It says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he's quoting to us from Genesis, Genesis 15. It's not that Abraham was this super spiritual person. God said, wow, he's just amazing. He's just righteous in and of himself. No, Abraham was a pagan whom God called out of his country and uh, gave him a number of promises. And Abraham believed God. He trusted God and God justified him. God declared him to be righteous through faith, as it says in Genesis 15. This is a quote from Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, here's the problem, though. He could have just left it there and said, you see, that's, even the scripture confirms this. This is how you're justified through faith. But Paul knows that people, for some reason, will not accept that we are saved by the grace of God alone. 
The natural man wants to say that he has accomplished something. And so you, you know this. You tell people how people are saved, that we're saved through faith alone in Christ. And what do they do? They object. No, but what about this? What about that? But I've done this. Let's do that. Let's do this. They argue against their own salvation by trying to bring something that they do in order to be saved. And Paul knows that this is how people will respond. And so he anticipates objections. And in today's passage, the objection that he's anticipating is by his Jewish readers who will say, all right, we get that Abraham was saved through faith, justified through faith, and that's how we need to be justified. Yes, but, but Paul, surely we need to get circumcised in order to be saved. Surely. Because, come on, I mean, have you read Genesis 17 when God told Abraham to get, to get circumcised? He said to him, you have to get circumcised, and your children have to get circumcised. And anyone who does not get circumcised will be cut off from the people of God. So surely circumcision, circumcision is necessary for us to be justified before God, right? In fact, this is, it seems, if you read other um, writings from the time of Paul, not in the Bible, but <laughs> ancient times from rabbis, uh, Hebrew rabbis, um, they clearly believed that circumcision is necessary in order to be saved. They said that if you are not circumcised, you're, you're just going to go straight to hell. You, you cannot be saved if you're not circumcised. Not only are you going straight to hell if you're not circumcised, but if you are circumcised, you cannot go to hell. <laughs> in fact, there's some writings, this is going to be weird, but I'll just share it with you. There's some writings that suggest that if there's a person who's circumcised, a Jewish person, and he is just the most wicked, idolatrous, apostate Jewish person in the world, God has to somehow reverse his circumcision in order to send him to hell. Because he's circumcised, so we can't go to hell. So we have to somehow make him to be uncircumcised again in order for God to be able to send him to hell. Okay? Circumcised people cannot go to hell. Uncircumcised people cannot go to heaven. So, the Jewish person may be thinking, okay, I know that I haven't kept the law perfectly, but at least I'm circumcised. At least I'm in. At least I've done that. And today, there are many people who fall into the same error, heresy, that the Jews fell into. They see that God commanded something for them to do, an ordinance that God commanded, and they take it to be salvific. They take it to mean that this must mean that there's some kind of power, some kind of saving power. That's what the Jews believed about circumcision. There's got to be some kind of saving power in circumcision. And you do it and you get saved. And what are, you can find Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, uh, if you just take, say, baptism, for example, or Church of Christ, isn't it Church of Christ? where they'll teach, they believe in baptismal regeneration, which is that you get regenerated, you get the Holy Spirit, you get saved, you get justified when you get baptized. They believe that there is saving power to the actual act of baptism. Or you could take the Lord's Supper, where they believe that you have to have communion in order to be saved, that if you do not consume communion, you cannot have spiritual life. That's why when they baptize babies in the Greek Orthodox Church, right after that, they give them communion also. So that they can be saved. Okay? So as the Jewish person, God commanded circumcision, so they say, well, that's, we've got to do it in order to be saved. And they were wrong. So you have many people today who say, oh, God told us to get baptized. So that means you can't get saved if you're not baptized. Which, again is wrong. They believe that there is power within the ritual, within the act, within the words that are spoken, within the, within the act that is performed, that there is some kind of saving power to that. 
thus together with the Jews of Paul's day, not trusting in the grace of God alone for salvation. We'll get back to that, but let's talk about the text. Paul has been speaking about the blessedness of being accounted righteous apart from works. That's verses 1 to 8. He was talking about how we are justified, how we become righteous before God apart from works through faith. Through faith apart from works. And in today's passage, he's going to take it one step further and he's going to talk about again how we are justified through faith alone apart from circumcision. So, he asked the question, verse 9, does this blessedness, this is the blessedness of justification, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Now, to be justified, to be accounted righteous, is it only for the circumcised or is it also for the uncircumcised? Is it only for Jewish people? Do we have to become Jews in order to be saved? Or is it also for the Gentiles who are uncircumcised? And he says Abraham was accounted as righteous by faith. Okay, we know that. He's already mentioned that before. Genesis 15. Okay, verse 10. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Answer, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. This is so simple, but it's extremely powerful. It's so simple, but it's impossible to refute. When was Abraham justified? When did God look at Abraham and say, you are righteous through faith? When did that happen? Genesis 15. Okay. When was Abraham circumcised? Genesis 17. Now, I don't know a lot. But I know that 15 comes before 17. I can figure that much. In fact, if you look at the history, Genesis 15 is at least 14 years before Genesis 17. Okay? At least 14 years. There's, there's disagreement as to the exact chronology of Abraham's life, the timeline, but, so it could be more, but it's at least 14 years from the time that God justified him declared him to be righteous until the time that he was circumcised. Okay? Long time. So Paul says, was Abraham justified when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Answer, uncircumcised. Abraham was still a Gentile when God justified him. Which means that circumcision is not necessary for justification. Case closed. Right? <laughs> is, there's no way around this. There's no way around it. Okay? It's just plain. So we could just stop there. Paul could just stop there and say, well, there you go. End of story. But we'll talk a bit more. Um, so I want to talk about this verse a little bit because there's a lot of lessons here that we can learn. In verse 10. Um, okay, so the first lesson that we learned from verse 10 is that circumcision is not necessary for justification. Okay, we saw that. Second lesson, something that we learned from verse 10, is this. Notice how important it is to know the Old Testament. Notice how important it is to know Old Testament history. When we have Bible studies on Thursdays, for the past year we've been going through the historical narrative of the Bible. We've been looking at the most important historical events in the Bible. And that's not just a history lesson. We need to know these things. They're in the Bible because God is the one who is working out his salvation through history. So we need to know what God has done to save us. And studying the Old Testament apparently is important. Paul's entire argument here is based upon knowing Old Testament chronology. <laughs> That's his point in proving how we are saved, how we are justified before God, is based upon Old Testament chronology. So it's important to know the Old Testament and its history. Okay? That was the second lesson. Third lesson from this verse. 
Justification is something that occurs once in a moment in time in the life of the believer, and then it's past. Okay? It's not a process. It's not something that happens throughout your life. It is something that happens when you believe in Christ and trust in Him, and God justifies you. There's a moment in time. There was a moment when Abraham was justified, and it was before the moment that he was circumcised. Okay? Justification is a one-time event in the life of a believer when God renders his verdict and says you are just, you're not guilty through faith in Christ. Now, the reason I want to point, something that I want to point out here, we need to be careful to use correct terminology when it comes to these things. There are many times when evangelicals you say things like this, we are saved by faith alone. I've probably said it, and you've probably said it. Salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is a moment in time. Salvation happened when we believed. Okay? Now, that's not completely wrong, but it's not completely accurate either. And we need to be careful. And let me tell you why we need to be careful. Because the enemies of the faith will hear us say, salvation is a moment in time. Salvation occurs when we believed and then we're saved. And they'll say, oh really? Salvation is a moment in time? And they'll point us to passages in Scripture that talk about us being saved continuously. Or they'll point to passages in the Bible that say that we will be saved in the future. And they say, you see? Salvation is not something that occurred once in the past, saved by faith alone, once, and now we are saved. Salvation is a process, which is concluded at the end. We need to understand that the word salvation is a general term. Salvation includes many things. Our salvation began before the foundation of the world, when God chose us in Christ, when God elected us. Salvation includes predestination. It includes election, it, pre it includes calling, it includes justification, it includes sanctification, it includes our glorification at the end of the age when we are, when our bodies are resurrected. All those elements have to do with our salvation. Okay, so yes, salvation can be used for every one of those aspects, how we are being saved. When the Bible says we are being saved, it's talking about our sanctification, being conformed to the image of Christ. When it says that we will be saved, it's talking about our resurrections and our glorification at the end of the age. And so if we want to be precise, without people saying, oh, you're wrong, salvation is not once a one-time event, we don't believe in salvation by faith alone. We believe in justification by faith alone. Okay? Justification is a moment in time. Justification is the moment when God declares us to be righteous through faith. And that was past tense for believers. It happened once, never to happen again. You have been justified. Okay? Point that out just so that we can have more correct terminology. Because here, Abraham was justified back in Genesis 15. Okay? So, Abraham was justified before his circumcision. Fourth lesson that we can learn from this verse, verse 10, this kind of argumentation that Paul uses here for justification and circumcision, we can use the same kind of argumentation when dealing with Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholics for other issues, like, for example, baptism. Example. Or a Greek Orthodox person says that you must be baptized in order to be justified before God, to be saved. Okay? Well, you could take him, for example, to the book of Acts and show him the story of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was an Italian man, and Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter went and preached the gospel to him and his family, and Cornelius believed. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he started speaking in tongues, and 
the, the Spirit came upon him and he, and, and he praised God. And Peter was like, well, this guy's saved. <laughs> like the same thing happened to him as it happened to us on Pentecost. So uh, I think we should baptize him, shouldn't we? And they're like, yep, I guess we should baptize him since he's believed and the Holy Spirit has come upon him. Yes, let's baptize him. Question, was Cornelius saved when he was baptized or before he was baptized? Answer, before he was baptized. There's no way around this. He was, the Holy Spirit came upon him while he was yet unbaptized. Okay? So, same, argu same argumentation follows. That would mean that baptism is not necessary for justification. Okay? Now, having said that, don't be one of those people who say, well, if baptism doesn't justify me, it doesn't save me, then we don't need to do it. No, circumcision didn't save Abraham either. That doesn't mean that it was optional when God said, get circumcised. He meant it. And so when God tells Abraham, get circumcised, he, does, he obeys. When God says, get baptized, we obey. Okay? Just because... And someone says, well, why do we have to do this if it doesn't save us? None of God's commandments save us. None of God's commandments save us. That doesn't mean that we can say, well, we don't need to obey God. <laughs> We're saved by faith. That's what antinomianism is, which is a heresy that says, well, just believe and do whatever you want. No. Okay. So just as circumcision is not necessary for justification, you're justified by faith alone, um, same goes for any other ritual that you could perform. Um, so, Paul has said that Abraham was justified without having been circumcised. Okay? And so, what's the response going to be to that? The response is going to be then, well, if circumcision doesn't save you, doesn't justify you, there's no power, salvific, salvific power to justification, why did Abraham need to get circumcised then? What's the point? Why do you even have to do it? He answers that in verse 11. And Abraham, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. Let's stop right there for a second. Why did Abraham get, say, get circumcised? He says it was a sign. What does a sign do? points to something, okay? You're walking along the street and you see a sign that says to the airport, you don't go and latch on to the sign and say, I'm at the airport. No, it, it's pointing you to something else, okay? It signifies something else. And it says it was a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was still uncircumcised. So it was a seal, like a stamp. You know how the kings in the past would have a signet ring and they would sign something and they would put their sign, their, excuse me, their seal on it, which authenticated it. It meant this is from the king. Okay? And so Abraham had a seal put on him and that seal was circumcision. Okay? And it signified this one here is righteous through faith. Not by his works. Through faith. This one is righteous. That was the point of Abraham's circumcision. It was God's stamp on him. Circumcision didn't, didn't make him righteous. Okay? Circumcision didn't do anything to him. It didn't change Abraham in any way. It was a sign. It was a seal that said, this one here is righteous through faith. Okay? That's what it was. And the same thing goes for New Testament ordinances also. Those are also signs. You know, baptism doesn't change a person. It doesn't make you righteous. It doesn't do something to you. It's a sign. It's a symbol of something. It signifies something. I want to show you something. And then hold your place in Romans 4 and we'll come right back. Go with me to 1 Peter for a second. 1 Peter. Peter here has been talking about the flood. How people were saved through water. <laughs> how the eight people were saved through water. And then verse 21, 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter says there is also an antitype 
which now saves us. Baptism. And all those who believe in baptismal regeneration, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and so forth, say, well, there you go. We've been saying this the whole time. There is now an antitype which now saves us. What's that? Baptism. Baptism saves us. There you go. It says so. So you guys are wrong. But of course, Peter then explains what he means. <laughs> and what does he say? Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. He says, baptism saves us, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. What is baptism? What is water baptism? It's a bath. You get in water. Why? To be cleansed, right? To be purified. You're taking a bath. That's the point of baptism. But he says, baptism saves us, not the external washing of the flesh. When I say that baptism saves us, I'm not talking about the external getting in the water. That's not what saves us. Washing the body is not what saves you. Well, what is it that saves us then? What is the baptism that saves us? The answer of a good conscience toward God. What does that mean? We're sinners. We're guilty. And therefore, we have bad consciences. We have guilty consciences. How can our guilty conscience go away? How can we have a clean, good conscience? If your sins are forgiven. If God forgives your sins, if God cleanses you, cleans you from your sins on the inside, now you can have a good conscience, right? Because your guilty conscience has been cleansed through Jesus Christ. And so the answer of a good conscience before God is when you repent and God forgives you and cleanses you on the inside. And, Paul, and Peter says, that's the baptism that saves you. The cleansing, the purifying that happens in your conscience is the baptism that saves you. Not the external. The reason we do the external is because it's a sign of what God has done on the inside. He has cleansed you. That's the real baptism that saves us. And then we go and we get baptized in water to signify what God has done on the inside. Why was Abraham circumcised? It was, a, it was a seal on him that said, this one here is righteous through faith. Why do we get baptized if it doesn't save you? Because it's God putting a seal on you and saying, this one here is clean. This one here has been cleansed, has been purified of his sins. That's the point of baptism. So let's get back to the text and try and close it up. Romans chapter 4 again. So Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. Why? Notice something here, something very important. Verse 11, well, let's read the whole verse again. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. Look at this. So that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be accounted, imputed to them also. Notice how it says, Abraham was circumcised, so that. Okay? When it says, so that, that means that his circumcision happened with a specific purpose in mind. There was a design, there was a point to it. Okay? God could have said to Abraham, well, as, soon as, we, as soon as he called him to leave Ur of the Chaldeans, he could have said, I want you to get circumcised and leave and go to a country that I will show you. But he didn't do that. He said, leave and go to a country that I will show you. And I'll give you all these promises and blessings. And Abraham believed and he was justified. And it wasn't until years later that God told him to get circumcised. Okay. Why did God leave this huge gap between the moment that he was justified and the moment he was circumcised? Was that just by chance that, ah, oh, let's tell him to get circumcised now? No, it was done on purpose so that... He, what does it say? 
he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. Abraham was justified by faith while he was still a Gentile, while he was uncircumcised, so that he may be the father of all who are also uncircumcised and Gentiles who believe. God purposefully waited for a circumcision until later so that Abraham could be the father of Gentiles who believe. <laughs> the Jews are proud. We are the children of Abraham. And Paul says, Gentiles are the children of Abraham if they have the faith of Abraham. Abraham's circumcision is a very unique circumcision. It's different from everyone else's. Everyone who got circumcised after Abraham got circumcised when they were children, when they were babies. But Abraham's circumcision was specifically designed to be after he had faith that he may be the father of all those who are uncircumcised and yet have the same faith as him. But of course, someone may say, well, so, so Abraham is the, God of the, is the father of the Gentiles? What about the Jews? So he gets to that too in verse 12. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Abraham is the father of uncircumcised people because he, was, he had faith when he was uncircumcised. But, he's also the father of, but he also got circumcised. And so he's the father of circumcised people. But only the ones who also walk in the steps of the faith that Abraham had. Just because you're Jewish and circumcised doesn't automatically make you a, a child of Abraham. You have, to have, you have to walk in the same steps as Father Abraham. Jesus talked about this. Remember in John chapter 8, people are saying, we're, we're the children of Abraham. And God says, if, and Jesus says, if you were the children of Abraham, you would love me. But you're trying to kill me. Abraham wouldn't do that. You're children of your father, the devil. Notice Jesus says to these Jewish people, when they say we're the children of Abraham, he says, if you were, you would love me. But they don't love him. That means that they're not. But we're Jews. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Galatians chapter 3 says, only those who have the faith of Abraham are the children of Abraham. God does not care about your bloodline. God does not care about your family heritage. He cares about faith. So Abraham, let's close. Abraham is the father of the uncircumcised who have faith. And he is the father of the circumcised who have faith. Two groups, Jews who have faith, Gentiles who have faith. What's the common theme between these two groups? Faith. Their genealogies are irrelevant. Their circumcision is irrelevant. It's faith that makes you the child of Abraham. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. Circumcised or uncircumcised, doesn't matter. It's the children of Abraham who have faith. And I want us to close. We're going to look at one short passage in, in the book of Acts, Acts 15, and we'll close with this. Acts 15, a very important passage. In Acts 15... The Apostle Paul is in Antioch, very Gentile church. And there are some people from the Jerusalem church who've come up to Antioch, and they say, you know, we think you Gentiles need to get circumcised in order to be saved. And he goes, what? We're going down to Jerusalem to talk about this. And he gets a bunch of people, and they all head down to Jerusalem. And Paul is there, and Paul goes down there, and Peter is there, and James, the brother of Jesus, is there, and the whole church is gathered. And Paul says, is this, is this what you're teaching down here in Jerusalem, that people need to get circumcised in order to be saved? And they say, no, <laughs> we don't teach that. We didn't send these people. The church in Jerusalem is a big group. I don't know who these people are who came and told you this. This is not what we teach. And Peter stands up, and he says this. Listen to these great words by the apostle Peter. Verse 7, Acts 15, verse 7. 
And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about Cornelius there, where he preached to Cornelius, and they believed. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. That's the baptism, by the way, that saves you, okay? He cleansed their hearts through faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Listen to those words again. We believe that we, the Jews, will be saved in the same manner as they, the Gentiles. The Jews were saying, Gentiles need to get circumcised and become like us. Peter says, no, we need to become like the Gentiles. We need to stop trusting in our circumcision. We need to tr stop trusting in our works. We need to stop trusting in the fact that we're Jews. We need to stop trusting in ourselves and what we do and be saved the same way the Gentiles get saved. you know how they get saved? Through faith alone in Christ, by the grace of God. That's how they get saved. That's why we have to get saved too. There is no work that saves you. There is no ritual or ordinance that saves you. You're saved through faith alone in Christ. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.